Today we're going to be revising electric fields. I'm going to be following the OCR Physics A specification, however the knowledge for electric fields is applicable to all exam boards. Okay, well, let's get started. The first thing that we need to revise is that electric fields are due to charges. So the presence of electric charge, be it positive or negative, will be creating an electric field around it. You can model a charged sphere as a point charge at its center. This means that the physics is identical no matter whether you have a charge and you are distance r from it, or you have a fully charged sphere, which can be modeled as just having a point charge at its center. The electric field lines themselves follow a few rules. Let's revise them. First off, they always go from positive to negative. They also enter and leave surfaces, surfaces at 90 degrees to that surface. For instance, with the first rule, if we have a positive charge which is just sitting by itself let's just zoom in like so the field lines will be coming out of this positive charge radially so if we had a negative charge though the field lines will be going into the charge if I was to have two charges, one positive and one negative, there's going to be a net electric field between them. Notice that the field lines always leave the surface at 90 degrees, essentially radially, and then enter the other surface at 90 degrees. The way we will draw them is we would leave radially and then we would curve towards the other particle and then going in radially as well, producing this pattern. If we had two like charges, though, there was not going to be a resulting net electric field between them. For instance, if I had two positive charges, there's not going to be a region of electric field that will actually get cancelled out uh, in between because the charges will actually be repelling each other, producing a similar field as the one that I've drawn just here with my fantastic artistic skills. One more pattern that I would like to revise is that of a charged sphere next to a charged plate or a charged wall. For instance, in this case, we have a plate which is positively charged and a negatively charged sphere. Notice how in this case, as always, the field lines go from positive to negative and they also leave the surface at 90 degrees and they also enter the other surface at 90 degrees as well. Okay, well, now let's talk a little bit about electric field strength. If I have one positive charge over here, this will have an electric field around it. Let's say that I place another positive charge somewhere in its vicinity. Now, both of those charges then will experience a force of repulsion because they're both positives and uh, positives are going to repel. The amount of repulsion that they're going to experience will actually be determined by the strength of the electric field. The electric field strength is actually defined as follows. So let's just write down a formula for it. Here's our electric field strength. This will be equal to the amount of force a positive test charge will experience per unit charge. And the formula for it is the force divided by the charge. The unit for it will be newtons per coulomb, which of course in physics we would often write as nc raised to a power of minus one. While we are talking about units, let's quickly work out the base unit for electric field strength. So we know that the force is in general equal to ma, and we know that q is equal to i times t. Now the unit for the mass is of course the kilogram, the unit for acceleration are meters per second squared. Then we're going to divide this by i times t, so the amps multiplied by time, which is measured in seconds. This would imply that the base unit for electric field strength will be kg meters. Now s to the power of minus 2 divided by s will give us s to the power of minus 3. And we've got amps here at the bottom, so what we can write is A 
to a power of minus one, which is the base unit for electric field strength. We said that there will be a force of repulsion between those two charges. Let's see whether we can quantify this force. Of course, we know that just simply from rearranging the electric field strength equation, that force will be equal to the electric field strength times the charge. However, let's see whether we can do a little bit better. Let's see whether this charge is Q, and let's say that this charge here is uh, lowercase q. The amount of force will actually be given by Coulomb's law, which is one of the most important laws in A-level physics. This tells me that if I have two charges which are separated, let's say, by a distance r, so the distance between the two charges will be equal to r, the amount of force that they are going to experience will be given by the product of the two charges, qq divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. The uh, value of the two charges is uh, normally given in the question, so we need to find them out. In terms of what's at the bottom of the equation, we just have 4 pi and epsilon naught is just a constant. It is approximately 8.85 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 12, and this is given in your formula booklet. R is the distance between the two charges. And I just want to mention the most common error probably in A-level physics, and that is to forget to square a quantity. So when you're calculating the force, please do not forget to square the distance between the charges. Okay, well, now let's focus on the amount of electric field that let's say that this charge here will be experiencing. The electric field strength will be equal to the force divided by the charge of this particle. But now we have an expression for the force. So we can substitute this directly into this equation. So the force is given by QQ over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And um, because this here is my force, what I need to do is divide by the charge Q. So if I'm dividing by, by a fraction, it will be the fraction by a number. It will be the same as multiplying by the inverse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by 1 over Q. And notice that the two charges, Q, lowercase Q, are going to cancel out, which gives me yet another expression for the electric field around a point charge Q, which will be given as Q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. This is the this is an expression for the electric field strength around a point charge only at a distance r from it. This means that, uh, let's say if this was this charge Q, if I wanted to go a distance r in this direction, I can find the electric field strength here. If I wanted to go a different distance, let's say r2, all I would need to do is just sub in r2 into this equation, and I'll be able to find the electric field strength around this point charge. Okay guys, now let's compare the gravitational fields with the electric fields. In order to do so, let's imagine that we have two protons, and just to recap, the mass of a proton, I'm just going to write it down over here, is 1.67 times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms. Now, if we just have those two protons, what two forces are are they going to experience? First off, there's going to be a repulsive electrical force over here, which I've um, labeled as F subscript E. Additionally, there's also going to be an attractive gravitational force because the two objects have mass and by Newton's law of universal gravitational attraction, they will attract each other. Now let's calculate the magnitude of those two forces. Now that we have calculated the electrostatic force, let's also calculate the gravitational force using Newton's law of universal gravitational attraction. So Fg will be equal to minus G, which is our gravitational constant. So that's minus 6.67 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 11. The product of the two masses is going to be 1.67 times 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms. I'm going to square that because the 
two masses are equal. Also do remember that the mass of the proton is indeed given in your formula booklet. What we need to do next is divide by the distance squared. So that's going to be divided by 0 0.10 or 10 centimeters squared. And um, if we plug this into a scientific calculator, we are going to get a tiny, tiny force of about 1.86 times 10 to a power of minus 60 two newtons so we can see that the electric force has a relative much bigger strength much it's so much stronger compared to the gravitational force and a typical question would be to calculate the electrostatic the ratio of the electrostatic force to the gravitational force so let's just quickly do this um, so our electrical force will need to be divided by the gravitational force which will be 2.3 times 10 to the power of minus 26 newtons divided by 1.86 multiplied by 10 to the power of minus 62. And if we plug this into a calculator, we are going to get about 1.24 multiplied by 10 to the power of 36, which is an incredible factor. The electrical force is so much stronger than the gravitational force. Okay guys, so now let's compare the electric fields with the gravitational fields directly. First off, the electric fields can be both attractive or repulsive depending on the sign of the charges. The gravitational fields on the other hand are always attractive. The field strength for electric fields is given by the force per unit positive charge, whereas for the gravitational fields, the gravitational field strength is given by the force per unit mass. The field strength will for electric fields is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared or minus GM over R squared for the gravitational fields. The force equations in both cases, this is really interesting, are inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Additionally, as we've just proven, the electric force is multiple times stronger or the things being equal compared to the gravitational force. Now let's have a look at the electric field between two parallel plates. I've drawn the pattern here as you can see it consists of equally spaced lines, vertical lines which are going from the positive plate to the negative plate. Now what is the electric field between the plates. So as we know, the electric field in general is given by the amount of electrical force per unit positive charge. Let's also remind ourselves that the electrical work done will be equal to that force multiplied by the distance that has been traveled. Another expression that we know for electrical work done is that it's equal to the voltage or the potential difference times the charge. And let's say that equal to F times d. What we can do is direct, directly rearrange for f and then sub that expression into here. So let's do that. f will be equal to vq divided by d. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this expression over here and I'm going to get that the electric field, the f over q, rather than f, I'm going to write vq divided by d divided by Q, the charges are going to cancel out, and what I'm left with is just V over D. So this means that the electric field between two parallel plates is given by the potential difference between them divided by the distance between the plates. So it is this distance over here, D. And this is one of the most important formulae that we know about the electric field between two parallel plates. Once again, I'm going to write it over here. This is equal to V over D. Please know that this formula only applies for the electric field between two parallel plates or in, situation, in situations in which we can, we can generally assume that the field is uniform. Okay guys, so let's revise parallel plate capacitors as well. First off, if we have a parallel plate capacitor with no insulator between the plates, then the capacitance of that capacitor will be given by the permittivity of free space, 8.85 times 10 to the power of minus 2, multiplied by the area of one of those plates, divided by the distance between the plates. 
If we insert an insulator, also known as a dielectric, between the plates, then the equation for the capacitance will change by the factor of the relative permittivity. For instance, if the relative permittivity of this uh, capacitor was of this insulator was 2, then we have to multiply the equation above by 2. So the equation becomes ER, which is the relative permittivity, multiplied by E0 times A divided by D. Occasionally, you may come across a way of writing this equation as simply uh, E or epsilon multiplied by A divided by D. And uh, in this case as well, the um, epsilon will be equal to ER times E0. So let's have a look at the motion of charged particles in an electric field. In order to illustrate this, we're going to be imagining that we have a little electron which is entering with a purely horizontal velocity in an electric field. The initial horizontal speed of the electron in the horizontal direction is 2 times 10 to the power of 7 meters per second. And as the electron enters, just before it has absolutely no vertical velocity. Well, given the distance between the plates, let's call that D is 20 centimeters, which is 0.2 meters, and we know that the potential, as it's just written over here, is 5,000 volts. So, in the vertical direction, the electron will experience an acceleration as soon as it enters the field. This is because it will experience an electrical force, which will be given by the expression that F is equal to the electric field times the charge of the particle. Rather than putting the electron charge, I'm just going to be using Q because this could be a number of other particles as well. In general, the electron will be repelled by the negative plate. The plate above here is the negative plate and will be attracted towards the positive plate. So as the electron enters, it will actually curve and uh, leave across this side. We can find an expression for the acceleration using Newton's second law. All I need to do is write down that ma will be equal to E times Q. Additionally, we know that the electric field is going to be equal to V over D. So I'm going to write that MA will be equal to V over D times Q. Rearranging that for the acceleration, we'll get that the acceleration will be equal to V times Q divided by MD. Let's plug in some numbers for the acceleration of this electron as it enters the field. So potential is 5,000 volts multiplied by the charge of the electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. We're going to divide this by the mass, which is 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31. And then we're going to divide that by the distance, which is 0.2. And if we put those numbers into a scientific calculator, we're going to get about 4.4 times 10 to the power of 15 meters per second squared. Okay, guys, so here is a challenge. Let's see whether we can calculate the speed of the electron as it leaves the plates if the length of the plates is equal to 70 centimeters. Now, we know that there's a certain acceleration which is acting downwards on this electron. However, there's no horizontal forces. So we could work out the time that the electron spends between the plates using the horizontal speed. The length of the plate, let's call that L, will be equal to the initial horizontal speed. I'm going to call that VH multiplied by the time that the electron spends in there. I can just rearrange for the time and I'm going to get that the time is equal to the length divided by the horizontal speed. And let's write this a little bit more clearly. V horizontal the length is given to be 70 centimeters, so I'm going to write that as 0.7 meters. I'm going to divide that by the speed, which is equal to 2.0 times 10 to the power of 7 meters per second. Putting those into a scientific calculator, we're going to get that the uh, electron will spend 3.5 times 10 to the power of minus 8 seconds within that field. 
Now, because it's asking us for the speed of the electron as it leaves the plates, what I'm also going to do is uh, I'm going to use Pythagoras to find out the final speed. So you can imagine that the electron, let's just draw the electron over here, is going to have some vertical speed and will also have some horizontal speed. So um, if we just put this vector over here, the final speed will be this diagonal and uh, with Vy being here and the horizontal speed being here. The speed will be given with Pythagoras's theorem essentially. So I'm can just say that the final speed v will be equal to vy squared plus vx squared and all of that will be square rooted. Now the uh, speed in the horizontal direction um, is going to be uh, what was it? 2 times 10 to the power of 7 so 2.0 times 10 to the power of 7 squared plus the speed in the vertical direction, which we've just found, so just here, 1.5 times 10 to the power of 8, all of it squared. We plug this in, we square root it, and we get a slightly higher number. So that's going to be about 1.51 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second for the final speed of the electron as it's about to leave the plates. So this is quite a typical problem on the charged particles uh, moving in electric fields, but the important thing to realize is that there are several common principles. Number one, the electron will experience acceleration, and this acceleration will be given by this expression, which you guys should be able to derive. Additionally, we should know that the motion with the horizontal motion in this case will be uninterrupted, the speed will be constant because the force is only acting in the vertical direction. So let's revise another really, really typical question. We have a charged ball which is balanced on a piece of string and a charged wall. If the angle is 30 degrees and the weight of the ball is 5 newtons, find the electrostatic force between the wall and the ball. So, in this case, the tension can be resolved. So let's say that the tension is acting along here. This tension could be resolved into two components. One component will be a purely vertical component and one component will be a purely horizontal component. So the horizontal component will be acting along here, the vertical component will be acting up here. The vertical component will be balancing out the weight of the ball, which is just mg. In this case, we're, we're given that this is 5 newtons, so there will be 5 newtons acting upwards. The horizontal component of the tension will be balancing out the electrical force, which is acting the other way. So what we can do essentially is use simple trigonometry to work out the electrostatic force. In this case, I've just called it Fe. The function which is 9 times out of 10 useful in this type of a problem is tan. So I'm going to say that tan of 30 degrees is equal to opposite to the opposite over the adjacent. So the opposite is the electrical force and the adjacent is the weight. So this means that tan of 30 is equal to the electrical force divided by the weight. So the electrical force will be equal to the weight multiplied by tan of 30 and this will be equal to 5 newtons which is our weight as given here multiplied by the tangent of 30 degrees putting this into a calculator we're going to get about 2.9 newtons for the electrical force notice that uh, we don't need to provide this much detail in an exam literally we could write down tan of 30 is equal to the electrical force divided by 5 and just rearrange Okay guys, so finally let us revise the electric potential and potential energy. Just a little note that this is purely a revision video and I've actually made a 
really detailed video on this topic and I will provide a link for this in the description of this video. Okay, so first off, the equation for the force is equal to QQ over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. The equation for the electrical potential energy is given by QQ over 4 pi epsilon naught R. Notice that uh, the force is inversely proportional to R squared, whereas the energy is inversely proportional to R. In fact, I'm even going to underline this important difference. Now, what is actually the electric potential? It is defined as the work done in bringing a unit positive charge from infinity to a point. And this here is a very important definition. So, uh, yeah, I'm just going to circle it. The formula for the electric potential is given over here. This is energy per charge. So, if we essentially divide the energy by this charge Q, we get the formula for the electric potential, which is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R. The electric potential is zero at infinity. So this means that if I was to uh, take, uh, take the charge and bring it very far away, approaching infinity, that means that the electric potential will be tending towards zero. Let's divide, let's derive quickly the equation for the capacitance of a sphere. We can use this equation for the electric potential to do so. So the first thing that I'm going to say is that Q is equal to C times V. So charge is equal to capacitance times potential difference. The capacitance will be equal to Q divided by V like so, and um, this will be equal to Q times 1 over V as well. What we can write down is that V is actually Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R. So this means that C will be equal to Q divided by, let's write it this way, Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R. Now, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the inverse, so this will be equal to Q times 4 pi epsilon naught R. Let's change this R to a capital R because the radius of the sphere in this diagram is given as R like that. That's the radius of the sphere. So, um, so I need to divide this by Q as well. So all I've done here is I've multiplied Q by the inverse of this fraction, which is 4 pi epsilon naught R divided by Q. Notice that the two Qs are going to cancel out and I'm left with an equation. So uh, the capacitance of the sphere is actually just given by 4 pi epsilon naught R. So it's actually really interesting that the capacitance of the sphere depends solely of the radius of that sphere. So a really, really important equation. We need to know how to derive this. Finally, we may be given a force distance graph in an examination. And what we need to know, as always, in all types of problems is that the work done or the energy, so work done, which is also equal to the change of energy in the system, will be the area. So this will be the area underneath the graph. So I'm going to write this down over here. Okay, guys, so this was pretty much the entire OCI Physics A specification. Hopefully you have found this video useful. Good luck in any upcoming uh, tests and exams. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next video.